Welcome to the Podunk Polymouth, a podcast dedicated to the sentiments of a secular, sarcastic, screwed up Southern SJW and skeptic. I'm your host, Chris. Come on in. Welcome to episode 99 of the Poe, Triple Poe, that is, Podunk Polymath Podcast. Hope y'all are doing super spectacular. Let's see if I can talk. Lyman is not going to be here, or at least if he is, won't be until later because he had some work emergency, or that's what he says. He may be missed shit. Um... Also, I wanted to mention that last night we were on the Zach Relich cast with Zach Law. I, was, that's, I think it's been my sixth time on there. Apparently, he can't get anybody, any, any else, anybody else better. I'll get better with it. Uh, and that was, he had a song for Lyman, mostly. And he basically sat there and talked, which is fine. That's the reason I have him on the show. So anyway, uh, go to his YouTube channel. Uh, check him out, Sacrilege Cast. Of course, he's on Facebook under the same moniker. You just look for him. It's pretty unique name so it starts to it's sacrilege but what's like a z basically anyway enough of my rambling uh let's get on to our guest tonight this is our guest week uh i met her at we were just talking about this at a christmas it wasn't christmas but it was around the holidays she was uh leaving to go to uh, oregon i can't remember yeah uh so and uh we did cards against humanity and we had a good old grand time and then i didn't see her again for god knows how long but anyway uh, she's doing something in the green room. I, I guess she can hear me. Okay, anyway. Uh, join me in welcoming Ashley Hall. How you doing, Ashley? Hey! I was trying to sign it was eight months, because that's how long I lasted out there. So... I'm trying to see how... What, I'll show you if I can, like, you know, charades. <laughs> well, I couldn't what? see myself, but I was trying to do this, but I'm like, what is this going to look like? It looks like a gang symbol. It does look like a gang symbol. I'm like, yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah. I just this is why okay I think it's the si- actual sign language is this but that also looks like a gang symbol so <laughs> no no offense to our hard of hearing listeners um so oh I do want to say that YouTube now uh, does it automatically didn't you oh, you nice. had to put your own caption but now it has the 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 soft um, the technology to automatically translate of course it doesn't always work it's yeah I'm worried about it. I'm very worried about that. <laughs> Well, well I tried it out. It's pretty accurate as long as you enunciate. I can't make any promises about okay, that. Well, <laughs> okay. Well, you know, don't do it drunk. Maybe just slur your words. Ah. Uh, you know. See, this is why I only had one beer before this. Well, I don't have that except. <laughs> um, so actually, I wanted to have you on uh, because you're cool, first of all. But secondly, uh, I knew that you had been a, or were, whatever, a social worker. That was one of the reasons. But also, I wanted to talk to you about uh, autism, another subject I've been interested in. I don't know anything, but uh, <laughs> you pee, you know. Um, <laughs> don't do you know that. what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying. Yes, I do. Um, so first of all, let's go ahead and talk about the uh, social work. Okay. Well, um, basically... I started out with my master's in social work. I graduated in 2013. And in 2014, I moved to Nashville for my first job. Um, I did my internship in crisis, um, basically suicidal, homicidal um, with youth, 17 and under. I primarily work with kids throughout my non-social work career, like teaching Sunday school back in the day. Um, I worked residential treatment for about four years while I was in grad school. Um, when I first moved to Tennessee, that was my first job out here. I worked at a wilderness camp for about a year. And um, then I worked for um, a residential for youth who were developmentally delayed. So it wasn't just autism. There were a lot of different diagnoses. But um, that was the main thing I did throughout grad school. And then I moved to crisis in 2014. I worked there for about three years. Um, I got promoted and moved out to Portland, Oregon um, to start a program out there because they were having difficulty because they had so few crisis beds. Um, they needed a program like ours, but I didn't last very long for various reasons. I won't go into that. Um, but uh, let's just say it was a it was a life changing experience out there. So, and right now I'm not doing social work um, currently. I'm I work at the safety department for a tech company. So I have not been doing it for a couple of years. So I've been a bit, I've been out of it for a while. But um, the insights that I did get were pretty interesting because I always find it fascinating how little people know about um, social work for one. But what I would like to ask is, when you think of social work, what do you think of? Uh, 
uh, trouble for poor people, uh, you know. Yes. Under oh, that's even, true. Uh, probation. Well, I did go to many juvenile halls, so yes. Um, uh, at least I did. Um, but social work is, most people, when they think of it, they think of DCS or DCF um, or DHS or whatever you call it in your state. Because every state is different. It's basically the Department of Children and Families or Department of Children's Services or Department of Health and Human Services or whatever the heck you want to call it, Adult Services, um, which works with adults. Um, most people think of social workers as people who take, come into families and take kids away or work for the state for various reasons or work for the state thing is social work is very very broad there are multiple tasks tax you can take in grad school if anyone listening is getting a psych degree um social work is actually a really viable option because there are two different tax you can take there's the micro side which is colloquially known as macro which is mainly if you want to do individual counseling um if you want to get licensed as a social worker um because I'm sure if you've gone to a therapist, you've seen like the little letters next to their name, like LCSW or L LPC or LMFT. LMFT is licensed marriage and family therapist. LPC is licensed practical counselor. Then this is in Tennessee, by the way. It's called different things elsewhere. But if you see LCSW or LISW or LGSW, LMSW, that's a licensed social worker. Basically, if you have a social work license, you are able to be a therapist, um, master's level. You can also get a PhD if you want. Um, and there's also the macro track, though, because social work is very unique from like a counseling program or a marriage and family program because there's a very strong emphasis on social justice. There is like I took a leadership course, even though I was going to therapy track, I took a leadership course. I took a politics course. I learned how to write my congressman. I went to several various events about granted a lot of them were preaching to the choir but some of the people in my program needed it because a lot of people <laughs> were just coming from for the therapy part of it and not the social justice part of it but that was a big emphasis in um in our program and in pretty much all programs for social work because it's part of the code of ethics that you do need to participate in politics so there is a macro track where you can work on um community organizing um like starting a nonprofit, that sort of thing. Now, there are actually licenses for that now. I think it's called Advanced Practice in Tennessee. I don't know where it is everywhere else, but there are licenses for that. Um, and the people who you do see that um, is the more colloquial version of social work, they're usually bachelor's level. They work for the state and they are the ones who essentially go into people's homes and evaluate um, these situations. But people... There's also programs that do that, um, at least for youth. I'm sure there's programs for adults as well. I know there's multiple ones, but at least for youth, the ones that I dealt with, there were multiple methods to make an impact outside of that, outside of going to people's houses and taking people's kids away, which is actually rarer than you might think. Um, I mean, if you've been around the non-Nashville parts of Tennessee, you've probably heard a bunch of colloquial stories about people's kids being taken by DCS. But there have been many, many, um, and I don't know if there's any other rural areas around. I'm sure that's the case. But there's actually, it's actually a very difficult process, at least here. Right. And it's something that is a difficult thing to do as you can probably imagine it's a difficult decision to make and at least in tennessee you need a judge's order so but but I, I at least they did when i was there so yeah i have some listeners something that might they might want to know yeah person. because i just know that in rural tennessee it's a lot life is a lot different in rural tennessee mm -hmm. it's putting it a little mildly yeah um it's not quite the same here in the city so I think you saying that about getting your kids not easy. Um, it yeah. might be of some. some uh... Cause I know that the main, a lot of, there's a lot of worry, especially for people in poverty. And I think that that's especially true. Um, and that's yeah. true for rural and urban folks. Um, so because people in poverty don't have as many means and there's highly higher likelihood of abuse. And I think that's just more of a function of poverty than it is a function of other stuff. But there's been a lot of different situations that are not as black and white as one might think. The black and white cases are so rare. Um, usually it, it's DCS workers and pretty much everyone in positions like mine, like crisis, um, and 
in situations like the other workers that I met, there were those who had intensive in-home services. Like several agencies do provide that where a therapist goes into the home probably three times a week at least. Um, that's typically paid for by Medicaid. It's not paid for by private insurance. Pretty much the only thing private insurance pays for is therapy and hospital. So, but at least in Tennessee, I don't know about anywhere else. Um, they actually were really good when I was in Oregon. Um, but I, I wasn't there long enough to like really get in the nitty gritty of how things were out there. Um, but <clears throat> they definitely had their own problems as, as do every, as does every state, but Tennessee actually is surprisingly progressive when it comes to mental health, um, for a red state, not don't, <laughs> for, a red state. <laughs> for a red state. Um, it has the safety net program, which works with adults who need counseling. And it also provides, I mean, there's so many programs to provide and they actually, all the crisis programs in Tennessee, I won't say which one I worked for, but they all have very high quality care. So um, there's a bunch of, you know, politics and everything. And again, I don't know how it's been since I've been gone since Bill Lee's taken over because Haslam was very um, good about that. Um, but I don't know. I haven't been on the inside ever since, so I don't know, but I can tell general things. <laughs> so yeah, it's been difficult to talk to friends about it because it's hard not to be there, I think is the big problem. So, well, how much leeway, I mean, I'm kind of going, getting a little bit into that aspect. Mm -hmm. Do you know how much leeway uh, a social worker has as far as they have like strict guidelines? Mm, it depends on the person. Um, it depends on if a DCS worker is involved, typically there has been a report of a varying kind. Um, they're basically the people who are the case managers. They set things up for the, the family to have. Um, and the number one goal is reunification with the family. And there's always a reunification plan. Um, here's what needs to happen for reunification to take place and for us to leave this family's life. Um, even if a child is taken away... Um, that's the case. Now, if a child is in the system, severing parental rights is usually made by, there's a decision made by the courts, and it's typically either done voluntarily by the parents, which actually happens more than you might think, um, or it's done not voluntarily. And there's typically, that's typically a decision made by a judge. Um, it's definitely not made lightly. I mean, all the decisions that I've seen made are typically pretty bad. Um, it's hard for me to go into details now because I don't want to give too much away because the problem with explaining this is I'm a little nervous about it because I don't want me to say something and for it to be taken as legal advice. Do not take anything I'm saying as legal oh, yeah. advice. <laughs> um, do not take anything I'm saying as legal advice. This is just a general idea to understand what it is in case you don't. So if you are currently going through this situation, I highly recommend you contact a lawyer or contact your DCS worker or contact a, so a therapist or a case manager or someone who knows your situation. Do not talk to me. I have it. I have experience, but I don't know your situation. So, but um, it's a very, um, it's a case by case basis. And it's very hard to say how much leeway someone has because the parent always has the number one um, say. You can't force anyone to do anything like go to therapy, go to family therapy. You can't force people to change their attitude. You can't force people into rehab, especially if that person is an adult. Um, and there's, a, except for the clear cut cases, it can be a very um, difficult situation, especially if the case is the adult is more unable to care for the child as opposed to unwilling. And like, if there's an, if they're in the care of like a older grandmother who just is not able to anymore, or they're in the care of, like someone who is developmentally delayed or if they're in the care of, I mean, there's, there's a lot of situations like that. It's just so hard to kind of pick a situation. So, but leeway, when you say leeway, what do you mean? I should have probably know. said that up front. <laughs> well, it's just, rambling. I don't know if they have some sort of um, I, uh, discretion, discretion to like make <clears throat> a decision. They calls. can make decisions on their own. They can put that, decision into a judge and they can also make recommendations about what treatment needs to be because that's their main concern is not only to sort of monitor how the family reunification plan is going they basically have to look at all the points like if the house needs to be cleaned up or the bugs need to get out of the house or if there's a certain boyfriend who keeps who shouldn't be there and is in the house or but probably one of the more common ones was 
house cleanliness. And when I say house cleanliness, I don't mean like my room where there's clothes on the floor. I mean like bugs, house falling apart, like pet doo-doo and stuff like that um Some hoarder, shit, hoarder like. shit yeah and cleaning all of that up um there's also medical neglect so there's so many things that a, basically a dcs worker needs to go in and they need to say okay here are the things that need to change before this is a safe environment this needs to be cleaned up to this point and we'll do what we can to help and we'll bring in this person to help you can't be forced to do any of this but if you don't things aren't going to end well so Basically, that's their job. Their role is to be the go-between between between the state and the family to make these changes to keep the child safe, essentially. Okay. Let's zoom back out because I kind of got in the weeds on that. Well, I I do the same thing, so no worries. (laughs) Um, So let's kind of get back to what general kind of what would be... Like we were talking before, you said, uh, talking when you think of social work, think about, and we're kind of getting into the different. What was kind of your main? F- my main focus was working with youth. Um, my the big thing I wanted to do was to make do an autism focused, like disciplinary, well, multidisciplinary, not disciplinary like this, but multidisciplinary, like helping with the family, helping with the youth, and trying to find better ways to um, help families who are going through that situation. That was my like long-term goal, but my short term was that I liked working with kids. I wanted to do play therapy. I worked with kids my whole career. I was always very good at it. Um, and I also wanted to help kids through the sort of same situations that I went through because um, I went through my own mental health issues as a kid. So that really did make me passionate about it. Um, so that was my main focus. I wanted to do that. Um, mainly also because I think there was also a part of me that said, well, kids won't judge you as much as adults. <laughs> so that was always the hard part, but that's a whole other story. So that was something that I wanted to do. And kids were really the thing that I was good at. And the reason I went into crisis specifically was because that's it was good for my type of brain. I like the assessment portion. I like the investigation portion um there are a lot of elements of social work and therapy in general that are very how shall i put this like nebulous not very concrete crisis is very concrete it did well for my my uh my strengths so that's why i did well at that when i was in crisis so that was why i focused on what i focused on um and but eventually i wanted to get my well, my license um with all of my hours and I wanted to do maybe get my play for therapy certification, start my own practice. Cause that's a big one for a lot of social workers is private practice. Once they get their license, they're allowed to basically open their own practice and take on clients on their own. Now um, they can also, once you get your license, a lot of doors open, you could work at a hospital as a medical social worker. You could work at I mean, license, if you look for social work on pretty much any job board, most of them require the LCSW or the LMSW or the LPC or what have you, because that's essentially where so many of the jobs are. So even if I decided I didn't want to work with kids anymore, I would have a lot of options once I got that license. And that's one of the reasons why I chose social work over, say, counseling or LMFT was because it was a very broad, very open-ended discipline. And that's why a lot of people went into that, not only because it was a shorter program, although it was. Um, It was very much a, it helped open more doors than, say, counseling. So that was why I went into it, was was for practical purposes. I knew what I wanted to do, but just in case I didn't want to do it anymore... I had options. Well, I mean, I'm glad. I mean, I'm, you mentioned the uh, work. First of all, I'm sorry, let me backtrack a little bit. Uh, you spoke about crisis. When I, exactly do you? When I say crisis, I mean we have, we got called when there was a youth experiencing suicidal ideation, homicidal ideation, um, psychosis, or an attempt of any kind. Um, we saw kids as young as four. Usually, the the younger kids had aggression issues. Or were saying not so great things, and the older kids were the ones who dealt with a lot of self harm and suicidal ideation, suicide attempts, that sort of thing. So we got a lot of calls from hospitals, got a lot of calls from prisons, well, juvenile detention centers. We got a lot of calls from schools and homes. Homes were a big one, but 
there was a incorrect assumption that we could only call from an ER. So we did go to a lot of emergency rooms. I think that was the place we went to the most. So usually that was where we saw the most kids because it was the most secure. And from there, we made the decision of what to do next. Most times we were able to do a safety plan, send the kid home, say, here is what's your insurance. Here's a good therapist for you. Um, I recommend, oh, you're already in therapy. Well, let's bump it up to once a once a week or twice a week, or maybe doing the in-home services if you have Medicaid or TennCare in here in, in Tennessee. Or if it was severe enough and there just wasn't an ability to make a safety plan or the family was just not having it or the situation was severe enough that, or we had con- or we'd gone out there multiple times and nothing was working, then that was when we would say, okay, we need to put this kid in the hospital. And then we would... Um, call hospitals around and see where they could go essentially. Cause we, if, if a kid with Medicaid was going to get into a hospital, they needed an assessment from us. Basically the crisis programs in Tennessee are funded by Medicaid for that reason to assess kids who are about to go in the hospital. Now we didn't just see Medicaid kids. We saw a bunch of different, we saw private insurance. We saw all that sort of thing, but that was our main function. Okay. So that sounds kind of emotional draining. Yes, it is. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, especially since, I mean, what I had to do was, I mean, we pretty much went all over. I mean, we went to, I was in rural Tennessee so much, it's not even funny. So, and I think it was just the driving and all of that. It is emotionally draining, but it was very rewarding. And I did enjoy it. Um, I just didn't get much of a social life. Um, it's definitely not like it is now. So, um And that's, uh, it, people have been in crisis for a very long time. It's probably one of the more sustainable ones other than private practice that I've seen. People can do it for a while, but there's certain, the things you do to get your licensure hours before you have your license tend to be probably the more grueling ones, like working for a nonprofit, like, um, or a community mental health center or crisis. Those can be probably the more difficult places to go just because the pay is not great. And I mean, the clientele are pretty much wonderful wherever you go, but it's, it can be, it can be very difficult, especially if there's clientele on drugs or clientele who are on, who are often in poverty and have difficulties that um, you can't really do a whole lot about other than give them resources that they may or may not take. I mean, it can be draining and it often is draining for a lot of people who go into the field. Yeah, that sounds like something you couldn't do already prone to your ears. Yeah. Uh, whatever. It was one of those things where I had worked in residential previously. Basically, uh, there are four levels when a child is in, in Tennessee. Now, there's always an asterisk in Tennessee whenever I talk about anything. Um, there's four levels. There's level one, two, three, four. Level one is normal foster care. Level two is therapeutic foster care. Level three is a group home. And level four is lockdown psychiatric. And that's where I worked. Um, and basically, having done that for so long, this crisis was not as big a deal. Um, so I, which was a good thing, maybe. <laughs> um, but it was definitely a, I mean, I'm not in it anymore, if that tells you anything. So um, it it's hard to last a while. So it can be very, it can weigh on you quite a bit because you try to focus on the good ones and you try to focus on the ones you helped, but the human brain is really dumb. Loves to focus on all the times you could have helped or could have done more or that kind of thing. So, hmm. uh, so I had a good, uh, kind of a lead in when you were talking about working with TIST or you wanted to work with, let's kind of go to go in that direction. Start talking. The other part, which I mentioned, (laughs) she was, uh, autism. So for lack of a, what, what is autism? (laughs) <laughs> I that's like, a broad category i was I eager to see how you were going to start this part <laughs> just just for my own amusement um what is autism you. <laughs> what is autism basically you could go by, by the dsm definition or you could go by just the regular definition basically autism is a a developmental disability and it's a set of symptoms that encompass in difficulties in social functioning, difficulties in communication. Um, And those are the primary ones that the DSM focuses on now. Um, Typically, now there's so much to it that going into it now would take me a very long time. But the main aspects of autism are repetitive behaviors, 
and repetitive um, interests, basically having a very set focus on one interest at a time, or maybe like three interests at a time, basically an obsession with routine. This, this is my routine and deviation from that routine. Um, difficulty with change, difficulty with um, learning silly. So if you talk to an autistic person, you might find that they're sort of copying your manners. That's kind of the best way they can go about it. Um, because like I, I like to tell people that the way that autistic people often learn social skills is not necessarily through. I came up with a great metaphor the other day and I can't remember it now. It's really it's driving me crazy. Um, it's like... It's like learning to paint by kind of harnessing your creativity or learning to paint by just paint by numbers, kind of. Like you can learn to paint, like that's kind of how I paint is paint by numbers, not going to lie. It's uh, based, there's that. And there's also communication difficulties because a lot of people with autism do experience problems with communication. A lot of them can't talk. Um, a lot of us can't talk, I should probably say. Um, and there's also sometimes when we can, we don't learn to talk until much later because the outside world does not have as much influence on an autistic person. So there is not as much need to communicate um, verbally. Typically, it's not seen as anything that's necessary. So, and that's kind of how I put it in that way. Um, so if that makes any sense whatsoever, that's essentially how it is. But autism is so freaking complicated. Those are the main things that I usually lay out, though, is the repetition, the social problems, the difficulty, learning social things naturally. Hi, kitty. Not mine. Oh, here comes mine. <laughs> difficulty learning things naturally and the communication issues. So those three are often the things people look for when they are diagnosing. Now... Go ahead. I was going to say, I, I mean, right up a little bit, obviously, very little, just to kind of get an idea just to me. Sometimes I wonder if I have. But anyway, so, uh, but I know there's, they've kind of gone to the spectrum, uh, ASD. Yeah. So why don't you kind of explain what? Well, they used to have, um, see, our diagnostic Bible in whatever mental health you're going into is called the DSM. Now, in the DSM-4, they had a bunch of names for stuff. They had autism, autism autistic disorder they had asperger's syndrome they had Rett's syndrome they had a uh, persistent developmental disorder not otherwise specified which uh, that's a lot, of, a lot of letters so they had all of those and in the dsm-5 the newest edition that came out in 2014 i believe or 2013 i can't remember um but they decided to just make all of that autistic spectrum disorder because they noticed in their research that Asperger's syndrome, which was named, which was discovered in 1944, was basically autism without the communication problems. So they decided to lump that in with autism and like Rett syndrome, or I think there was one called, I forget the name. It had something to do with degeneration disorder, degenerative disorder. It described how like, say a three-year-old can talk just fine, but then a year later he can't. All of those are now under the autism umbrella. Because they were all seen as something different. So now there are specific symptoms that we look for, but we have to kind of pick them out. Like, say there's 20 symptoms, and if you have 10, you're on the autism spectrum disorder. But you could have 19, you could have 12, and they all come from the same place as just different severities. Um, and when I say severities, I mean how much into your own world are you? And how much, how connected with reality are you? Like, if you're going to another country and you're confused, are you going to London or are you going to Thailand? And basically, if you see a guy who only knows English wandering around Thailand and he has no idea what he's doing, that's the uh, lower functioning. And if you see someone walking around London who kind of doesn't know what they're doing, might do, you know, this once in a while, which in the London speak is actually the middle finger. Be like, hey, peace, guys. Hi. <laughs> like a dumb American. That would kind of be the higher functioning autism. So if that makes any sense. Um, so disassociative. Uh, no, disassociative is something different. That's essentially when you're just cut off from reality. It's kind of like it, autistic people are not cut off from reality, but their brain doesn't really know how to filter it. Oh, okay. So it's kind of like you are have like clanging symbols in your head all the time, like you know, the cat meowing and the air conditioning. And most people 
most people's brains figured out how to filter that stuff out a long time ago. But people with autism, that is not the case. There is all this noise going on at once. It's all very distracting. And people sometimes have difficulty sifting through all of that noise and trying to figure out what's more important. And that's and that's probably the biggest reason why people with autism are often very much cut off from the world. Um, there's a lot of other reasons for it. I mean, the specific neurological or neuroscientific reasons are very complicated, and I have not learned them because um, I've tried to kind of – because every single – explanation of autism I've seen has been so freaking complicated. I've been trying to figure out ways to say it in a more plain language because it can be a very difficult thing to decipher when in reality it really isn't. It's not that difficult to decipher. It's That's why the puzzle piece is kind of going out of favor because it really isn't that difficult, but it just takes some time to understand. And I always put it as basically someone... I always call autistic people immigrants in their own country because either it, the noise just pushed all of that stuff out and they weren't able to learn effectively or there were just all these other difficulties and they just didn't catch on to it. So when you talk to an autistic person, they're going to be talking with an accent. They're basically their social. It's like someone talks language with an accent, but your social interactions are with an accent. You're basically... Sometimes it can be fine, but it's just kind of off. And sometimes it can be so off that it is extremely noticeable. And that's how I usually describe it in a way. And that's why I, and I describe it in that way so that people can kind of understand, try to sort of connect something familiar with something that might not be so familiar. And that's autism, which despite the incredible voice of a lot of autistic adults nowadays, it's still not very well understood. It's probably the most common insult I see on the internet nowadays is autistic. So it's, yeah, <laughs> it, it's replaced retarded, which was around when I was a kid. Which is, so, <sighs> well, we're probably going to, I mean, considering that's starting to happen, we're probably, well, yeah, pe people still use that. But I mean, we're probably going to have to replace autistic soon in the DSM because I've noticed that. You know, like you usually when you find a word for someone who's different, it's going to be used as an insult. And when it gets prevalent enough, you got to change the medical definition because yeah, uh, you don't want to add the negative that. connotation. So I'm sure you know this very well, but it's very fun, I'm sure, to be a diagnosis well, I mean, namer. Idiot, imbecile, and moron. You... Oh, yeah. I'm going to turn off my TV. I look like I'm blue. One sec. There we go. Okay. Now I'm yellow again. <laughs> <laughs> um, I hope that description made sense um but if it doesn't is there anything you want me to clarify no i mean that was a very good overview as mm -hmm. a general definition mm -hmm. maybe we could drill down a little uh spoke of the uh definition of autism uh now let's kind of look a, a little bit more at the spectrum let's let's go kind of we're looking at a spectrum let's say the low end what would you consider to be give us some example of somebody Usually people on the low end of the spectrum don't have um, speaking communication skills. They are able to use usually sign language or pictures. Pictures are a big one. Um, but usually they express themselves through, you know, they have very specific routines. Usually there's a lot of hand flapping to calm one down. Um, but there's also difficulty regulating emotions. Like, say, if something goes wrong, even if it's something really tiny, they can be, there's can be the most autistic meltdowns. And I say famous because apparently that's what autistics are most known for. Um, but the pro but they are very real, and pretty much every autistic person has them. When I have them, I cry. I just go into I just start to cry because sometimes the emotions get too much that it has a, you have a very difficult time regulating them. So and that can and especially when you have difficulty communicating or teaching somebody, and you can't have any outside help to regulate those emotions, and you can't communicate what you need. Sometimes that does reflect itself in some problem behaviors like aggression, for instance. Um, and usually the most common one is the hand flapping. The most co another common one is sometimes self-harm, hitting your head on the hitting your head on the wall, um, scratching yourself. Basically those are repetitive um, calming behaviors that are often just used to help regulate. And that's why some artificial things like a weighted blanket, or uh, basically just like a brushing or anything like that. Bas bringing calming elements into the environment is usually very highly recommended for 
and I keep putting low end of the spectrum on quotes because it's a very because essentially autism is the same amongst all people. It just depends on the level of noise. It's really hard for me to and the level of ability to regulate and the level of ability to communicate. So, because right, communi- yeah. so yeah, and. When I say that someone with autism is kind of in their own world, like one thing you'll notice with a lot of autistic people is we like to make up our own world words for things. Like I make my, up my own words for things all the time. Um, we kind of have our own stuff that we talk about. We talk in the way that we like. Like you'll see a lot of people use a lot of big vocabulary words. Um, the same thing happens on the lower end of the spectrum. It's just like... Say if you have a swing and you want to go on the swing or if you have ways of expressing yourself through say, hey, I'm just going to, oh, I'm hungry. I'm just going to take this you know, sausage off your plate um, or I'm just going to eat this thing and, oh, I can't have it. Now I'm going to scream because I am starving and I don't know how to say it and I don't know how to say that I'm hungry um, or that I don't like this specific texture because textures are a big thing. And again, that's one of the issues with autism is the inability to regulate a lot of things that to a lot of people are just kind of inconveniences are big deals because it's very difficult to regulate the feeling of unfamiliarity, the feeling of like, for example, you'll see a lot of kids with autism watching the same stuff over and over, especially on the low end of the spectrum. Now I've gotten better about it, but in a case, I don't know if we mentioned this, but I have autism too. I don't think we mentioned that. (laughs) So (laughs) in case anyone was really confused. So, Um, but I forgot if we mentioned that. I don't know. Who cares? I have autism out in the open. So I I forgot to mention it too. I was just, I was like, I'm sure he said it. Maybe he didn't. I don't know. But, um, but either way, uh, someone who has these difficulties have, it's hard to express how severe these feelings are. And basically every feeling you can think of having is just ramped up to 11, essentially. So you'll see a lot of screaming, a lot of crying, and a lot of difficulty getting through because there's a lot of uncomfortable things. Like, I'm going to be in a classroom and I have to listen to you, but there's this massive air conditioning and this chair is uncomfortable and this desk is really cramping me and I don't know how to, you know, let you know that I need to go in the corner. So how much of a disability those difficulties are can really affect how someone functions in society. Okay, so understanding this correctly, the only thing the spectrum does is the volume thing. I like to say the volume of the noise. It's not just noise, but noise is a very, it's a very good way that I say it just affects the volume of the noise. And of course, every autistic person is different and has different issues that they have to deal with. For example, my own issues with specific noises, some noises I can under, some noises I can handle, some noises I can't. It just depends on your familiarity with them. But depending how loud the noise is, that can make things very difficult to function. And sometimes it can be hard to hear other people and consider other people through the noise. And again, autism is so much more complicated than this. So don't take me at face value. But I have been trying to figure out, again, like I said, breaking it down into easy to understand terms is probably what I've been doing to deal with it, but also how I've been trying to communicate it, communicate what it's like for me and what it's like for the people who can't express themselves. Cause that can often be hard, especially on family members. Well, I think there's, you talking about communication. I think you would, yeah, well you, you would make a great computer. I don't, I'm thinking about it and I don't, we don't really have like a Neil deGrasse Tyson of autism. <laughs> No, well, we do you not. Know, like, no, he's actually, a science communicator. Yes. Right? So we need, like, an autism. Well, technically, Neil deGrasse Tyson is an autism communicator based on his recent tweets, but that's enough. <laughs> I don't know if you've been following him on Twitter, but he's been... Not lately, no. He's been adorable. Um, but anyway, uh, basically, we do. They're just not huge. Uh, have you ever heard of Temple Grandin? <laughs> Yeah, I've heard of them. Yeah, she is um, an autism communicator, but she's also an animal rights activist. She had a movie made about her that Claire Danes was in. Um, yeah. So she's a autism communicator. That's pretty uh, pretty prob- pre- prevalent. There's also 
I forget his name. His brother. He wrote a book called Look Me in the Eye. I forget his name. It's bad. But um, he's mm-hmm. also a good writer. He's definitely a good autism communicator. Um, I think he, I forget his name, but he used to be on the board of Autism Speaks. And then he left. Um, but um, so we'll get to that. But um, yeah, I'm so mad I can't remember his name. But I'm trying to remember some others. Greta Thunberg, I think, has been really. But her climate change stuff is mainly her focus. Yeah, not really but, autism stuff. But they're shitting on her so i don't like yeah i don't it's like a negative content it is it is a problem i mean i don't it's hard to bring her up in this because she's a prominent autistic but she's not an autistic communicator she's also 16 so she also has that going against her um when i was 16 my communication skills were if you put me in front of an audience at 16 you'd be like oh my god what's wrong with her so I do not envy her position, let me just say. But because those are the real ones that I can think of. I'm sure someone else might be able to give me some other ones. But well, that was kind of my point. I was like, yeah, you know, that really is their main job is. To, yeah. And I think it'd be very somebody who's who's well versed in it, but also is doesn't have an agenda. Of course, everybody has some. But yes. Oh, I have an let's, agenda. <laughs> yeah. Let's. But, yeah. So let's move into that. But I. That doesn't have an agenda like some people who include... Okay, so let's get into the whole, uh, I guess, the two points of view about viewing, looking at autism. Yep. And we we talked about the show. The kind of... One says it's a disease to be cured, basically. Mm-hmm. To, to put it, and the other is just... That's just a way of being. It's neurodiverse. Yeah. Uh, it's a normal spectrum of humanity. You know? mm-hmm. That's not something cured, but you're yeah. different. Yeah. And we're learning more about it, which is why... The, aut- the diagnosis rates have gone up is because we're learning more what it looks like and that it can look like a lot of different things. It's just another group of people um, and often group of people who have been forced into certain boxes um, that their whole lives and haven't really been able to be themselves. And autistic people are not alone in that. So it's really hard to kind of single us out. Um, but at the same time, it's becoming more and more of a thing with autistic adults, especially trying to communicate our dissatisfaction with how things have been handled in our lives. I think one big one I've been seeing is with um, ABA. Have you heard of ABA? No. ABA has uh, been the main evidence-based therapy for autistic people for a while. It's based, It's very behavior-focused. Um, essentially, it's focused on changing problem behaviors in autistic people. And a lot of autistic adults have been sort of seeing that as a problem because there are some behaviors like aggression that we do need to kind of change. But hand flapping is sometimes included in ABA. Um, uh, Basically, any calming behaviors that are included in ABA, sometimes the the repetition behaviors, basically things that are harmless, but just unesthetically pleasing. So, I mean, aggression's not harmless. Well, I agree. Thank you. Uh, aggression is not harmless, obviously. And there's a lot of difficulties raising autistic kids because of that. Oh. But there are ways to deal with that. Let me, and, sorry, let me put in real quick. What's ABA? Sure. What's ABA? Uh, applied Behavioral Analysis. Um, it's, it's okay. Um, but yeah, that's been the only real evidence-based therapy for a very long time. based and primarily used on low functioning kids who have really no other way of communicating and it's very in theory it's all based on positive reinforcement but not all aba therapists do that and that's been causing a lot of problems and i just learned this and i need to see if this is the truth but the same person who came up with aba or the same person who came up with conversion therapy for gay people i'm sorry (laughs) I just learned this, and I'm like, oh, that, that tells you something, doesn't it? Because, and that it has been something that I've been concerned with, because I used to, I did want to go into ABA for a while, but that's back when I thought that that was the best way to treat it, but the more I thought about it, and the more I grew up, and the more I kind of realized which behaviors of mine were were basically things people just got annoyed by because of aesthetics and things that people got annoyed by because of actually genuinely being hurt if I like hurt their feelings, which is legit. And like with every mental illness, like with every disability, you have to parse through on your own what things that need you don't want to be a toxic person. So you have to figure out which behaviors you need to fix. To fix. Um, fix. Yeah, but again, that's why 
I can't say for that's why I didn't name any behaviors because you don't know. But there's a but that's the same is true with autism. Like I have a I'm about to be very vulnerable with you right now. If you look at my fingers, mm. since I was three years old, I chew my fingers like the skin around my fingers. It's been something I've done my entire life. It's not aesthetically pleasing. It's embarrassing. Oftentimes I have an issue with bleeding on things. Um, and that's been something I've tried to change just because of the fact that it's a problem. But saying, but something like when I do this to myself like this, or when I have to go to the bathroom to cry if I get overwhelmed, or when I repeat what people say or say basically all the time, is that really hurting anybody or is it just kind of part of my quirks? Do I have to change it? And if someone says I should change it, why are they saying that? So, and ABA is sort of the little kid version of that. It's like, what parts, what behaviors are you trying to focus on and what are you not? And I think there's been a lot of a push to, for autistic adults to make those decisions as opposed to therapists, which I understand. But I also see the ABA side because if there is an autistic kid who has difficulty with aggression, that's great. But you can't But focus on the aggression and use other therapies to help with empathy and all of those other socially functional things. I know, right? Jesus. <laughs> well, you're talking kind of a milder uh, sort mm -hmm. of um, certain uh, stuff like that. As yeah. an adult, you might want to, something you might want to change just because for yourself or maybe. Yeah. You know, you kind of want to, you're right. I mean, we're fucking a species who likes to, <laughs> other people, generally speaking. I'm not one of them. Uh, <laughs> but other I hear people. some people like to interact with other people. Ah! Uh, so yeah, I can understand within a second, yeah. but, uh, also there is kind of the more extreme side, which is the idea. I, mean, I think extreme is the right word the yes, idea it is. that you can somehow cure autism. Now, this, <sighs> is an, and the only reason, let me, let me preface this by saying that I don't, if an adult, let's say for example, and this is just fantasy, but let's say for example, that like there is some magical thing that you could do and all of a sudden all the behaviors way that are and the noise stopped basically going mm -hmm. with you. <laughs> if you're an adult and you wanted that that's one thing yeah so but if you're a child is that something you should inflict upon a child and of course i'm using this as a very crazy extreme but that's hard that's the that's the ethical moral thing i'm looking at is like at, and this uh, and this dovetails into the the neuro. At what points do you kind of distinguish between the pathological model and just the normal realm of human? At what point does it be? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and I think that there is the realm of human behavior needs to be widened for sure. And I think that there needs to be more understanding about why not only why autistic people do things, but why anyone does anything. Basically, why do we require certain social things and why are we so protective of them and where do they come from and is it really that important? And I think that's something that, you know, people realize that with people being gay. It's like, is this really worth all of this to enforce this idea of marriage? And most people and most people nowadays would say no. no. Well, obviously. <laughs> the answer is no, just for you. Spoiler alert, it's no. No, it is it. You're, yes, the answer is no, because there's like no reason. It's like, why? Why? And that's something I always ask myself. It's like, why is this do for people? Now, I know why people don't want to be called names. That's obvious because names are powerful with human beings. We have, and I, once you are labeled with something, labels are powerful, names are powerful. And you're called names by a lot of people. It's starting to start to get in your head and it's going to start to, especially with our social conditioning in our brains. And this is something I'm fascinated by, as you can tell. But I think understanding that better as less of a function of completely autonomous, reasonable thinking spirit, bags of meat containing spirit, and human beings whose brains came up in order to survive as social beings and took on certain behaviors for certain reasons, but not all those um, reasons are relevant anymore. Understanding it in that way, I think, will leave more room for people with autism in a way. But that's more of a macro thing. Seeing autism as a pathology is a whole other problem because right, yeah. there is an entire grifter industry that feeds on moms. <laughs> like, 
like, and let me just first say, autism is hard as. Can I curse? Yeah. Hard as fuck to deal with as a mom. <laughs> because speaking of which, um, social brain evolution, you've seen babies, I'm sure, in the wild. Mm. Uh, they smile. They giggle. They kick their little feet and they have little hands. I just held one a couple of weeks ago. It was the best decision I ever made. Um, and they give you a feedback. Because like with every relationship, the mother-child relationship is that feedback loop. You change their diapers and feed them and don't kill them. And, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. they give... <laughs> <laughs> and you know my, my PSA to all the mothers <laughs> so, I'm sorry. keep your babies alive That's in case anyone needed baby. to hear that um, <laughs> babies are, are cute and and that's basically the, the exchange is that babies will be cute for you. They will smile at you. They will giggle. They will. And I mean, humans are programmed to love cute. That's why we love cats and we love our kitties and their little eyes and their little paws. It's just like we love cute. And that's why babies give us that feedback. But when a child has particularly bad autism, that is less of the case because there's less of those expressive facial expressions. Facial expressions, because on one hand, people with autism do really wear their emotions on their sleeve, and in another, they in another hand, they don't. There's less facial um, feedback. There's less of a feedback toward the mom, and so all the hard things about and the dad too, obviously. So there's less feedback toward the parents. There's less of so basically the parents are doing all the work. They're doing all the cooking and the cleaning and the cleaning up the diapers and everything. And the kids just not giving anything back, and making it worth it. And it's basically a one-sided relationship on the surface because in a lot of ways it can be a two-sided relationship. But when you're a little kid, that's hard, especially when the idea is that you're not – especially when you have been trained to believe either by – Andrew Wakefield or any other Jenny McCarthy people. We don't we don't say that. I'm <laughs> fuck Jenny McCarthy is Oh fuck her. Oh fuck her, of course. But I also don't want to dissolve into a pillar of salt um by saying her name, so I won't say it again. But I <laughs> Well, the alternative medicine industry depends on there not being answers for certain stuff. And autism is a big one because there's not a lot of answers for autism. Of course, the question is, are you asking the right questions? But even the questions that are legit sometimes don't have an answer. Like, how can I communicate with my child? Or how can I get that feedback? Or how do I know my child even likes me? Or how is my child going to survive? Those things are not easily answered. And where there are a lack of answers, there is quacks ready to fill in the gaps with their, with their snake oil. And... Oh, a big one I've been seeing lately is essential oils. Um, one of my oh, recent, ob I know, one of my recent obsessions is MLMs and or how horrible they are and what uh, multi-level marketing like Amway. Oh God, yeah. <laughs> like Amway for example. Yeah, exactly. Well, there's the a kingdom. bunch of essential yeah. oil MLMs. They're all sharing memes it's like, oh, this will cure your kid's autism. And there's also been um. Oh God! There was—I forget his name, and I'd rather not say his name because he's a—he's a cult leader who says that drinking bleach cures everything. Um, it's called MMS and Mo Mi Miracle Mineral Solution. And there's a couple people. There's a couple women who go around um, after feeding their autistic kids bleach, and they literally show pictures of their kids' intestines coming out and saying, "Oh, these are parasitic worms." They're getting cured. If that anyone wants, I mean, it's not. It's, it's not surprising, really. But I mean, it's disturbing. But yeah, uh, it sucks. <laughs> I mean, I guess it's one of those situations where, there by but the grace of God, go I. I could have easily been in those people's, those kids' shoes, if I was just a little worse in mind. Um. So, and I always tell myself they're basically have the same stuff as I do, just a bit more noise. So it's. I always look at that and I'm just like, oh my God. So I, I highly recommend um, a YouTube channel called Miles Power, at Miles with a Y. Uh, he's a British YouTuber. He goes into a lot of um, the alternative medicine stuff. He goes into MMS. Um, there's a lot of, but he goes into other stuff too. It's horrible. But um, there's, I mean, there's also some people who say, oh, autism's demon possession or whatever. I don't 
give two shits about them. They they're maybe like they're not even worth. They're not even worth talking about. The people who are like you know, and I'm sure they exist. And yes, it's they called vote. the Catholic Church. <laughs> no kidding. Like, and yes, I know the, they vote, the but like... sometimes the best way to treat someone is to just ignore them, forget they exist, mock them relentlessly when they show up, and you know. Well, when we were talking about autism speaks, I know that's a, yeah. a bad organization. I'm not exactly sure why, but I've heard um. Their... Now, keep in mind, I know there's a lot about Autism Speaks that I I have not really been looking into them recently because I prefer to forget they exist. Um, so things could have changed. And if anyone knows, let me know. Feel free. I'd love to know that this horrible organization is getting better, please. But <laughs> it's very... It, it has the wrong point of view. It basically talks a lot about autism, autism tests for pregnancy, which one of, that's one of the things a lot of autistic adults talk about a lot is, you know, the option to terminate a pregnancy before someone's born because of autism is something I'm torn about. Very torn. So I can't really say much about that. But, they, but they have like some... Like, if you look on YouTube at some of their PSAs, a lot of them treat autism like a disease, like a scourge, like a curse. Well, yeah, so, that's why I was... They're like kind of a peak, the quintessence of like the pathological. Exactly. And I don't know what their um, interest, their involvement is in the vaccine movement. Again, autism... Oh, oh just... Just sorry, vaccines do not cause autism. Let's go ahead and just get out the way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say this. I'm sorry one more that has time. to be said. Oh, it, it shouldn't have to be said, but it, it does have to be said. They're not going to get autism for crying out loud. But um, where was I? <laughs> sorry. Oh, it's okay. Oh, no, I do that shit all the time. I interrupt all the time. I have a problem where I, I worry that I'm going to forget what I want to talk about because it's so good. And usually it isn't, but in my head, I think yeah, it's right. I'll do that. And I'm like, oh, I gotta say it right now. And I, I, it's never worth it. So, but basically, I, I have not gone as much into autism speak as I probably should. Again, I just know I do not support them. I tell other people not to support them. They have the wrong outlook. They have the, they don't talk to a lot of autistic adults. Um, they're, they're mainly focused on parents with kids. It's, and it's the parents who are the focus as opposed to the actual kids. And it's kind of like a support for your horrible child. You have to survive having this horrible child and now you're going to, now you need some help with it and ways to figure it out. So as opposed to ways to figure out how to talk to your horrible child and, or not horrible child, but I mean, that's how they see it. Find better communication methods and stop, stop treating them like maybe meet them where they're at instead of expecting them to meet you where you're at. Because I think that's a big thing that people need to understand is I'm always afraid to ask for what I need because it always sounds like I need to be treated like a baby to get by. And like even something as small as doing like a chore list, because one of the parts of autism is executive dysfunction, which means that there is a difficulty with changing tasks in your brain and prioritizing things without like a reason. So... Like, I always have a messy room unless I'm having company because that's pretty much a reason to do it. Someone's basically telling me to do it by coming to my house. Or so someone tells me to take out the trash. I'm like, I'll take out the trash right now. I'll do it right now. But doing well, it on my own. Well, I'm looking at my fucking disgusting apartment because no one ever comes <laughs> over here. There's beer bottles everywhere. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. that can make things difficult. Um, so, yeah, that. But that's kind of part of it. It's asking for what you need is hard when you're an autistic adult and meeting people where they are. If you're an autistic child, you don't even know what you need. And at that, the ability for people to meet you where you're at is not easy. And to be able to decipher the communications that you give is not easy, but it takes time and it is possible, but it takes support and it takes a lot of resources and that's, I think, a problem in America generally. So that makes it even more difficult. So it is very hard for me to judge parents who are having difficulty with their autistic kid because there's sometimes a lot of difficulty getting the resources that they need. Um, but don't feed your kid bleach. Yeah. Don't um... feed your kid bleach. And don't expect, and don't, and I know that, and there are deaf who have expectations for their children that are unreasonable. 
and that they shouldn't have in the first place, especially if their kid is autistic. So there is a very big, like, I think when I was growing up, one of the big things for me was, why don't you wear makeup? Why don't you do something with your hair? You got to take care of your parents. And it was always something, and I got, you know, my family members basically saying, why don't you wear high heels? You got to have a pair of high heels. That's dumb. It's like, you got to look nice. Da, 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 da. So, and one of the things that I am not interested in, and I just don't have any desire to do, because it's not a special interest of mine, is that, like makeup and doing my hair in a billion different ways. Like the idea of spending an hour on my hair sounds like torture. So, I mean, and I still definitely consider my, I still consider myself a this woman i'm very much i like being a woman so in many ways so that's not the problem it's mainly just because i don't really take much interest in it so well that's but but that's a problem for some people and not just my family it's not meeting those expectations and expecting you to meet people where they are where they are for some reason as opposed to kind of meeting you where you're at or maybe even meet you in the middle i think that's the bigger yeah so that if we're talking about kind of that side of the parents wanting some of them are are are, probably have good well i would would assume most of them do they just a vast majority have good intentions they just don't really understand and organizations like autism speaks and their ilk are only feeding into those fears they don't help yeah (laughs) exactly they're they're having the wrong point of view and i think that there are a a lot of good steps in the right direction. There is the Autism Self Advocacy Network. Um, there are good, so if you're interested in autism as a cause, there are good. There it's a good place to go because um, oftentimes Autism Speaks is considered to be all there is, but that's definitely not the case. So please give to them; they're fantastic. <laughs> and also, um, there's a message board called WrongPlanet.com. It I haven't been there in a very long time. But that's also a good community for autistic people. So if anyone out there needs something like that, that is the place to go. Although I remember I go, I went on there to, just to kind of get like, okay, why am I not doing this yet? And it turns out, oh, a lot of, oh, all, the, a lot, all these autistic people have done this already. What's wrong with me? Because I often blame my autism for a lot of stuff when I probably should have been blaming other stuff that happened to me. So, yeah. But yeah, that's all of support and it, it just the role of ignorance just about it, just because you actually didn't really know. Like, oh, mm-hmm. look, that was a thing. And I'm not sorry. giving something a name is very powerful. And I think that there's a big within the autism community. There's a big debate about self-diagnosis. And personally, I'm torn on it because I know that getting mental health resources is very difficult, especially in this country. So on that end, it might be helpful. But I'm also very wary of people giving themselves a diagnosis because one thing i know is when i look in the dsm i'm always like oh that matches me oh that matches me and it's too it's too easy nowadays especially go on the internet well i got cancer apparently so (laughs) exactly go to webmd well look at there i have especially if you're hypochondriac. web i am a massive hypochondriac webmd is not good i have definitely had my fair share of webmd rabbit holes so (laughs) it's never good um Uh, Go ahead. No, I'm done. Oh no, I'm just gonna try to. Um, oh. but I did want to briefly talk about the neuro, uh, the other side of the issue, which was like treating au- autism like people. <laughs> I, I know, crazy, right? Who are on a diff? Just happen <laughs> to be on a well, a different planet, like you say, maybe. Different, wait, well, it does feel like a different planet, and what well, you just said, and that's kind of why I brought up the whole like going to another country thing because oh, yeah. it can't often feel like you're kind of an immigrant in your own country because you don't get anybody or you don't like really really get it. i mean you get people to an extent but it's just like why do people do that Ugh, kind of thing it's like people are so impossible because sometimes and sometimes you forget that the things you do require a lot of thought and a lot more thinking it doesn't really come naturally so there's that but um um basically that's why i say like wrong country wrong planet because it can often feel like you're kind of by yourself and no one really gets you in a deep way i mean for a long time i think before honestly facebook i mean facebook is granted facebook is destroying our democracy but (laughs) it's fine it's fine but it's been a godsend for people like me because i can see like people who deal with the same stuff i do 
And it's like, I don't feel as alone. Now, to be fair, you still feel alone, but it can, it, you can feel less alone than before. Because I have found, I mean, the secular community in Nashville has been awesome for me. Um, not perfect, but no one is. It's hard for me to find any place that's perfect. But it's definitely been probably one of the more places I can be myself the most. Um, and it is probably, and that includes church places and everything. So that's probably been, and it really has been, I can't really put my finger on why. I think it's been more, one thing I'm more mature and I know more about how to talk to people, but at the same time, it feels less like I'm having to fit into a certain box aren't as important. And I'm not saying this is universal with secular people because they're people. They have the same no. problems everyone else does. <laughs> so, tell you right now. <laughs> no, trust me. I've, anyway. I, I, yeah. But what it takes is just finding people who just are willing to put up with you and make it not seem like they're putting up with you kind of thing. So, and that's, yeah, I think that's what it all boils down to. And I think that mm -hmm. goes for any, anybody really just find somebody, especially if you're a difficult person. Which yeah, I fit that more yeah. and certain other people do too but um <laughs> but um so uh but yeah it can but and i'm i part of me wants to give advice to other people out there who are dealing with autistic people or have are autistic themselves or think they might be autistic themselves and i don't feel like i can it's it's hard to do that because every autistic person is on their own little island. They got their own little stuff. There's a lot of similarities, which is why I it's a diagnosis in the first place. And every person who, and with people who aren't autistic, neurotypical as we call them, I have no freaking clue how your mind works. So I have no advice to give. <laughs> All I can tell you is kind of give a thought about what social things you hold dear and think about why. Maybe kind of the things you might not have thought about. Because I think everyone in the past 20, 30 years, especially if they're coming out of Christianity, has done that once or twice or 50 times. Um, or maybe if they're not coming out of Christianity, maybe if they're, you know, just changing their points of view on something. Or I think everyone's had to examine certain things in their life, why they do certain things and why other people do certain things. And I think that's important to just keep in mind because with a lot of people with autism, they're going to be looking at you and saying, why the hell do you do that? Why does anyone do that? Why do people want to slather paint on their face it's okay. <laughs> and go to a sports game when it's 100 degrees outside? Why? It sounds like torture, but people so, do it. Uh, it's in, it's empathy. Basically yeah. As well, but, and we, that's in short. So. It, is, it is a whole different conversation, but I will say empathy was not. I think I learned my best empathy in grad school because not everyone has $50,000 to spare to go to grad school for social work. So I'm going to, so I think probably one of the best ways to have empathy is to, first of all, read, read people's stories. And second of all, listen, seek first to listen and you won't be a dick. So, yeah, like and that. then <laughs> I'm rewriting the Bible to be more pithy because we tweet now. So, but although I will say I like Twitter and, until it gives me panic attacks, and then I have to, to delete it well, off my phone. Okay, that's one of the things <laughs> so, you can plug. When you go, I get okay. All right. Um. Oh no, I'm 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 a lo I'm loving it. I can rant all I want, <laughs> ramble all I want. I love it. So. Well, that'll be all for right now. We probably. Can. Uh, yeah. Well, it's it's past my bedtime because I wake up at four. Well, not so. right. <laughs> not right now. So. Yeah. Um. But. So thanks for coming on, Ash. No um, problem. This is actually thanks for inviting been me. I, this has been really informative and really, this is something I've really have learned some things mm -hmm. about. You have been a really good yeah. communicator, which I'm telling you, you need to, you need to look into that. I might. And also I wanted to add a little PSA. Every autistic person is different. I'm sure there's many autistic people out there listening to what I say. And I'm like, that's not what it's like for me. What the heck are you talking about? Tell your story, please. If you have difficulty telling your story, if your writing is easier, do it and prove me wrong. Do what you need to do because we want to hear all the voices we can to help as many people understand as we can. So I just want to put that out there. Uh, is there anything you wanted to plug? 
Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Aspie Social Worker. That's spelled A S P I E. Social and worker spelled W R K R. I'm I've deleted it off my phone for now because of yeah. But um, <laughs> I'm sure I'll come back. At, I'm sure I'll come back at some point. I haven't really been posting much, but I will if I get more followers. So if you want to hear what I have to say in 280 characters, um, if you want to friend me on Facebook, uh, feel free. I'm just don't be a don't be a creep. Um, you know, so, but, um, it's, uh, I'm, I'm friends with Chris. So just find me there. I'm lazy. I'm not going to tell you what my, um, facebook.com slash Asherton. Um, and you can also, off the top of your head. and you can also find me on Instagram. I'm barely on there either. But again, if I get, if I get, if I get a following, I might actually do it. So it's like cleaning my room. If I, if I have people coming over, I'll actually clean my room. And if I have people on Instagram, I'll actually put stuff on Instagram. So <laughs> that, that's okay. also asked me social worker. So, all right. And all the links that you mentioned, I would like to send me or want you to go. Sure. Uh, uh, I'll do that. I'll send. I'll send it to you. I'll send you Autism Self Advocacy Network. Oh God, I mentioned so much shit. I won't be able to oh, probably remember yeah. it all. <laughs> just some. It doesn't have to be right away. I'll probably just do a it. General, you know, I'll do it tomorrow stuff. when I wake up. The, sh- the show. Okay, works for me. Okay. So. Well, again, thanks Ashley for coming on, and I encourage everybody to look at those resources. If you have anybody that you know or any family that you then I just go look in these things instead of being a judgmental prick if you are one it's not good for you. <laughs> that's, don't do and that's generally just don't be a prick like me. Just no. just follow that rule in life. Or do okay. be a prick like him. He's he's a famous podcaster, so you know. Okay, obviously you you're delusional. Okay. So we're oh God, <laughs> I, I, well, I have face. I have I have so many scary faces. Nah. Just making sure you did that on purpose. You tried. And I, you tried. Okay. Anyway. You tried. <laughs> all right, actually, well uh thanks again for coming on and uh no problem it was a pleasure to be on i'm glad i I finally got to see you in action watch my show more you might see more anyway okay i I have stuff to do Uh, (laughs) (laughs) of course i will watch your show more okay or listen (laughs) all right take care (laughs) no problem have a good night chris That'll do it for this episode of the Podunk Polymath Podcast. You can find this show website at thepodunkpolymath.com. You can download this show from this page or on Stitcher, iTunes, iHeartRadio, or from your favorite podcatcher. I'm also on Twitter at Podunk Polymath, on Facebook at facebook.com slash thepodunkpolymath, and on YouTube at youtube.com slash thepodunkpolymath. You can also join the official Facebook group for the show at Facebook.com slash groups slash the Podunk Polymath Podcast Posse. All those words are separated by periods. If you'd like to contact me, you can email me at podunkpolymath at gmail.com or you can leave a voicemail at 615-378-POPO-7676. The more bizarre, the better. If you'd like to support the show, become a member of the Patreon Posse. Go to patreon.com slash the Podunk Polymath and for as little as $1, you can become a patron and make me feel like this whole endeavor wasn't a big waste of time. And plus, you can also stroke my ego. You can also make a one-time donation to the show via PayPal at paypal.com dot me slash podunk chris i want to thank everyone who listens to the show i really do appreciate it until next time y'all take it easy now okay